Dr. Ramdidi, context awareness, please. Okay, so uh, before we start, it'd be good if you follow me on Twitter, because you know I'm trying to build up a Twitter base, but uh, yeah, I know it doesn't work. Anyway, uh, anybody here knows what context awareness actually is? No? Interesting, okay. Well, this is basically what it means, right? It's the idea that you can build devices and software that can sense and react to the current situation. Basically, you know, instead of having one size fits all kind of user experience, what you'd have instead is something that adapts based on what the user is actually trying to do. So let's take a look at a few examples. I guess the easiest and the simplest form of context awareness would be uh, if this and that. Basically, you say, okay, when this thing happens, I wanna react in that specific way. So in this specific case, you're building manual recipes for context awareness. And of course, there is everything related to retail. So if you've ever heard about beacons and you know uh, how sensing that someone has just arrived in a shop and you can push them some notification or promotion, this is context awareness about knowing that someone is in that specific location. Then probably one of the most famous example is Google Now, where they try to figure out what information you're interested in accessing so that you don't actually have to look for it uh, on your mobile phone. Recently, there also has been a few other uh, smart hardware, uh, like the Nest uh, thermostat. So the Nest thermostat is interesting because it was one of the first times that someone built a beautiful and smart device that can actually learn and adapt to what you're trying to do. But it's not just that it learns, you know, uh, what temperature you like at what time you like it. It also goes further by connecting with your car, for example, and sensing when you're approaching your house and automatically firing up uh, the heaters if that's what you want. Uh, and actually, they've done something quite interesting. Uh, they've started this program called Works with Nest, where they basically enable you to couple this with other devices, like, for example, the Joe Bone um, basically bracelet, so that whenever you wake up in this specific case, it senses it and automatically brings up the temperature. So see, this is the kind of intelligence that we are expecting from all of our devices and technology in the future and is already starting now. Uh, a French example is a company called Sense. Uh, they have a product called Mother. Basically what it does is it senses every time someone gets in and out of the house that they have like those small accelerometers that you can plug anywhere on your coffee machine and your toothbrush. And basically what it does is it records everything you do and gives you all kind of a different insights and also reacts accordingly. A recent project currently on Kickstarters, uh, it's actually the first one I backed because I thought that was pretty cool. Um, basically what these guys do is called Prisma. Uh, what they do is they adjust the music and they make playlists automatically based on who is in the room. So specifically here, what happens is they have like a sensor that says, okay, well, you know, there is this person, this person, this person, and they like this kind of music, each of them, so let's build like a playlist based on what everybody kind of likes. Which I think is really great because it's really the kind of intelligence that you'd want if you don't have a DJ at home or if you know, you're know you like a fan of some music that most people don't like, like me. And probably the hardest uh, problem of all uh, is the Google car. So the self-driving car is probably the most extreme version of context awareness because it doesn't have just to figure out something like you know the user moved, right? It has to figure out everything about the environment surrounding the car as well as figure out what everybody else is doing. So in this specific case, right, context awareness is taken to the extreme. And it's amazing to see that it already works and that that kind of cars is actually safer than human driving it. So how do you actually model context awareness? Um, for us, we see it with three different layers. There is the personal context, the social context, and the external context. The personal context is everything related to the user itself, you know, so what he likes and what he's currently doing, what is his activity. The social context is simply who the user is currently engaging with, right? So who are his friends, who are the people he work with, who are the people in the room, so on and so forth. And the external context is everything that's basically independent of the user. So, you know, the weather, uh, the fact that there is, you know, a McDonald's nearby and all that kind of stuff. And when you put all of these th three things together, Essentially, you can recreate uh, the current situation of the user with a pretty high accuracy. Some, some people also add a fourth layer, which is called devices, uh, but I mean, you know. Anyway, so let's take a look at the external context. Stuff kind of stuff you can do is, for example, model 
public transport flow uh, in Paris. So that would be interesting. Why? Because if you're trying to give users an indication of when they should commute, you want this kind of external context to come into play in the decision you're making. So you know you could very well have a transit app that tells you, hey, uh, the, the, the train is pretty full for the next half hour. You better go like in an hour. This is a kind of intelligence you can build. But also, you know, you want to know things like the fact that there is a concert uh, that the user likes to go, right? So, you know, you want to say, well, you know, there is a concert over there and, you know, it's going to disrupt traffic. You want to know where all the shops are. So, you know, lucky for us uh, and probably unlucky at the same time, uh, there are a few databases which are not public. Uh, so, you know, we might as well actually announce it. Uh, next week, we're launching sort of under the radar a new open data project where we're basically going to launch an app that lets people track places that we're going to put available in open data from the beginning. And the way it works is you don't actually have to even think about tracking places. It uses your location, and at the end of the day, you can just tag every single place you've been to. So you, know, you don't have to remember any anymore about opening an app and tracking it anymore. And we're doing this because getting a good database of places is one of the most important things that you need if you're trying to model what happens in the real world. So you, know, you also have things about the weather, uh, the street topologies, and basically you know, everything related to the city in general. Some examples of projects that we did by just looking at the external context. So this was an app that we built that basically predicts how many people are going to be on board of trains in Paris and gives you information about how full trains are going to be. Why is that useful? Well, precisely because you, know, you might want to actually sit on the train home and maybe taking it 15 minutes later will make a difference. We also did a project in parking uh, where we actually use context to predict where you can find a place to park as well as how long it's going to take you to find a place to park. Uh, this is a very old project. You can see it's an iPhone 4 on the screencast. Uh, this like back from 2012. And you know, we also did like a cool project where we modeled the way that the sun reflects in the buildings of the city and based on that help you find a cafe where you can actually be in the sun. Uh, yeah, that was pretty cool stuff. Uh, and also, we did a cool project around road safety. Uh, essentially, what we did here was look at all of the external context, so the street topology, the weather, and everything, to measure the risk of having a car or bicycle accident at any given point in time and place. This is actually quite useful if you're trying to build smart cars, because now you can actually build this kind of you know, risk context into self-driving cars. So this was great, you know, we did that for a couple of years, you know, went very well, uh, but we felt that we were missing, you know, a piece, which is we were not really wor thinking about the user. And in general, what we felt was that there was a really big problem in the way that people interact with technology in general. Because at the end of the day, most of our devices, most of the stuff we do is not really adaptive, right? It's like we all have the same iPhone with the same interface. And this is kind of a problem. So what we start to look into is what we call real-life computer interactions, right? So how can you use context to basically really, really build amazing interaction with technology in your real life? And this is particularly important because up until recently, interacting with technology usually meant sitting in front of a computer, right, and doing stuff online. It was not really part of your daily life, right? Because, I mean, you know, you didn't really, like, walk around typing on your keyboard. But this has changed. When we think about it today, it's not just your mobile phone. It's every single device you're wearing or using on a, on a daily basis, which is really kind of like embedded in your daily life. So you know, we need to start thinking about what would an interface look like for something that is part of your daily routine. So let me give you a simple example. Uh, to come here today, for instance, uh, I basically took my calendar, opened it, looked up the address, then I opened, Google, I opened Google Maps to see where the address was, so you know, started basically typing in information. Then I opened City Mapper to see you know, how to get here by, by tube. You know, I saw there was a couple of changes, so you know, I wanted to take an Uber, so I opened Uber and typed in the, the data again. And you know, because I also want to know who I'm going to meet with, I also looked up the LinkedIn profile of a few people speaking here. All in all, it basically took me for like one single meeting, six minutes, four apps, 200 keystrokes, and 17 typos. Which is, when you think about it, kind of like not normal, because my phone has been in my pocket for four years, tracking all sorts of stuff. And every single time I have a meeting, 
I do the exact same sequence of event using the exact same apps, accessing the exact same information. So like, you know, a very, very, very simple machine learning could basically say, okay, well, probably when this guy has a meeting, he probably wants to use these four apps and access these kind of information. And this is actually true for pretty much everything you do, right? So when you go to the gym, you're gonna be using a different sets of apps and you're gonna be accessing different sets of information. When you're traveling abroad, you're gonna be accessing different apps and using different kind of information. When you're out clubbing with your friend, you're gonna be using different apps and accessing different information. Basically, the fact that our mobile devices today have a fixed interface where you need to go and browse around, open five apps and type in stuff, is, just doesn't make sense anymore. And when you think about it, try to think about what happens when you have a thousand apps on your phone. I mean, there's just no way that you can use a thousand apps efficiently with an interface where you just have to like go to the fifth screen and into a folder. Anyway, so we fixed that problem. Okay, so we built, so this is just an alpha, so don't worry about it, but basically what we did is, by looking all of the context, so we pull information about your location, your calendar, everything, we're able to figure out what you're actually trying to do with your device at any given point in time, pull out the information for all of these services and apps that you're interested in using, and link you back to all of them. So rather than having to basically juggle between a few things like I did before, now all I have to do is basically open this app and it already knows what I'm looking for and gives me an entry point to everything else. So how does this kind of thing work? So the first thing we look at obviously is uh, the calendar. So, you know, I mean, that's my week, which is pretty, pretty bad. Uh, so actually looking at the calendar is not that trivial because even though I make the effort of putting people's names, most people just put in stuff like meeting with Oliver. How do you actually know which Oliver you're referring to? So this is where you need context, right? So you need to know that when you're at the office, there is a dude called Oliver something that you actually work with, and that's so when you have meeting with Oliver at the office, that probably means you're meeting with this guy. See, so you need to build this kind of intelligence, which is just is further than just you know, natural language processing. It's actually also using all kinds of different sources of information to understand everything about, about your context. But probably one of the most important piece of data is location data. So this is my location data from a day in London. It looks pretty good, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, you basically have all the places. The size of the circles are essentially the accuracy of the location points. What most people don't realize is that your phone is actually really bad at getting your exact location. This was in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago. I was actually still, right? So, you know, was I on the street? Was I in the building, <clears throat> left, right? I mean, where was I, essentially? And that is not even enough, because it's not just that your phone is unable to locate you when you're not moving. You know, how do you actually differentiate between moments where you're moving from moments where you're actually at a single place? You know, you need to differentiate between transit times and actual times where you're at a place. But it actually gets worse than this, because you could actually be walking inside a place, right? So when you're like in this, in this specific conference hall, you know, you're gonna be moving and walking around. So if you just look at things like the accelerometer, the accelerometer will think that you're actually walking, whereas in fact, you're still at the same place in terms of semantic meaning. So you need to start building, you know, the contextual intelligence, not just based on what you're actually doing, but based on the reference frame of what you're actually doing. So we built all of that essentially. So we built, you know, uh, I mean, I'm gonna you know, just not go through the detail, but essentially there is no less than 14 different algorithms going from this kind of crappy data into this, which is basically an estimate of your real location with an uncertainty, as well as a differentiation between moments you're still and moments you're transiting. So the green lines is because we said, okay, well, the purple line is where you were and the green stuff is where you actually transited in between these places. But you know, now the problem is, okay, well, I still have an uncertainty, so how can I tell where you actually are? You know, these are all the places, like actual places, that were within the circle of uncertainty I showed just before. So there are about, you know, 20 different places. How do I know that I'm at Starbucks or at the Zara shop or, you know, at Café de la Presse in that case? So for that, what we built is essentially two algorithms. The first one is based on contextual features of the place itself. So for example, a restaurant has 
a higher likelihood of you being there if it's at lunchtime than it is like, you know, at 5 a.m. And likewise, a nightclub, you're probably not gonna be there during the day. So this gives you essentially a first model. Then on top of that, we have also a reinforcement mechanism where every time we know that you've actually been to Starbucks because we have a better location fix, then that reinforces the probability that when there is a Starbucks within you know, a range of places, we're gonna, you're gonna actually be there. And all in all, what you end up with is basically a really, really precise timeline of where you've been, how long you've been there, and how you actually got in there. And we can do everything. You know, we can actually say when you were biking, when you were running, when you were taking the tube, which tube you've been taking. We can actually even say things like the tube was actually delayed because it took you longer than usual. When you start adding all of the stuff we talked about earlier, right, so all of the external contacts as well as social networks, what you can basically recreate is a super contextualized timeline of the activities you've been engaged throughout the day. And this is pre precisely the key thing here. You're using context to infer the user's activity and basically predict his intentions. This is super, I mean, honestly, it's super hard. So to give you an idea, there are eight people in my team working on that project for the last eight months, and all of them have a PhD. So it's like, it's a really hairy problem. So anyway, now that you have the user's intentions, you can do what we just said before. So you can say, well, I know the user currently is either in a meeting or going to a meeting, and I know that these are the apps that make sense for him at that point, and this is information that I should go and access. If you're at the gym, it's a different set of apps. If you're at dinner, it's a different set of apps. And by the way, we can actually also do that with very minimal battery impact. As a matter of fact, we take so few battery, you know, I had to put like the three dots because I, was, I needed to scroll down all the way down. In comparison, things like Gmail or Facebook take a lot more battery. If you have iOS 8, if you look at it, your, your email client is probably the biggest culprit of battery usage, actually. But the thing is, this is useful for a mobile app. But it's actually necessary for new kind of devices where there is virtually no way to input data. Take, for example, the Apple Watch, or any connected watch for that matter. There isn't any keyboard. You know, there is no way to type in information. Even worse, try to imagine having to juggle between five apps and typing in addresses all the time. It just doesn't work. Sure, you can talk to it, you know, but even talking to it, if you're trying to talk to four different apps... <laughs> wow, that was cool. If you're trying to talk to four different apps, it's actually gonna really take you a long time to just speak to it, and it's gonna be kind of awkward. You know, can you imagine yourself, like you're in a meeting, and you wanna book an Uber for your next meeting, you're like, uh, watch, please call me an Uber? It just doesn't feel right. With this kind of you know, context-aware interfaces, you're actually able to build devices that already know in advance what you're trying to do so that you never ever have to manually interact with it anymore. And it's not just for watches, right? It's for cars. It's for your connected shoes. It's for everything eventually that you're gonna be using. And so this is basically, you know, kind of what we realize is that, you know, if we project ourselves in 2020 in a world where there are supposedly 50 billion devices and we're each gonna be wearing eight of them and interacting with 20 of them on a daily basis, we cannot have this kind of like static interfacing. It just doesn't work. Can you imagine what happens if you get push notifications for every, from every single one of these devices all day long? I mean, that would be horrible. I mean, you need some kind of intelligence into that. And basically, this is what we're trying to crack here. You know, we're trying to build the technology and the interfaces that would create a real symbiosis between your technology and your real life. Thanks. <laughs>